So just quickly, this is the, the overall agenda that we're going to kind of do here today. Like I alluded to before, we're kind of showing you a little bit about uh, design thinking. You'll see that later on. But one particular part. So the only apology that I'm going to try to put out there is the fact that if you know the story about uh, the blind man and the elephant, hopefully what I'm doing is I'm not giving, I'm trying to give you a whole piece of the empathy, but that's just one piece of the whole overall design thinking part. There's definitely other parts. So hopefully you don't walk away thinking the elephant's a rope or a tree or something like that. I've got most of the stuff from <coughs> the Stanford B School. So, uh, Hasso basically gave Dave Kelly at IDEO free reign to build this school within Stanford to build the design. And if you, he has uh, Ted Kelly had the TED Talk. <laughs> we all know how you guys love TED Talk. So, as I, I encourage you to see that, and he actually gives a shout out to Hasso because Hasso basically said, you know, "What do you need? The money? You want money? You want to do this? Let's go at it." So, so if you don't know Dave Kelly, basically founder of IDEO, right? One of the most famous design companies. And they created this. And so the great thing about uh, Stanford, they're like MIT now. They're putting a lot of their information out uh, for public use. Yes, you can go to the course, and that's probably the best way to do it. I would say the next tier is probably some, you know, going to other people's presentations and derivatives of that, because this is a lot of their stuff is covered by the uh, Creative Commons uh, licenses from from there. And then, and then lastly, you know, maybe do some self-directed. They have uh, the bootleg, which I I taken a lot of materials from is up there, as well as they have <coughs> what they call mixtapes. They have three kind of self-guided tours. And on top of that, they have some videos that you can kind of see. So hopefully, we'll kind of show you a little bit. Hopefully, if anything, I would say it would whet your appetite and come. You guys always talk to me afterwards And SAP. We're heavily into design thinking. You guys can go directly to the D School. There's lots of them around the world. What we're talking about today. So if you kind of remember the curve that we talked about, that's not an inflection point. This is the one that we talked about before. Somebody in the audience today said, OK, you know, how do I know that product, creating the right product and stuff like that? How do I know I'm going to get that great user experience at the front? Well, you need a very dynamic process that has heavily uses the user in order to get that type of, elicit that type of information, create that design. And really, that's what design thinking and the IDEO really kind of create up. And that's what they're sort of famous for. So this is now a term to be design thinking. Just a, a little bit aside about that. So, so the guys are like talking about design thinking. The acronym, uh, the action verb, is sometimes called design doing. <laughs> Some people at our company said that that has a lot of connotations, or they don't like the way that's saying. So they, so they call it design executing. But the idea is that uh, design thinking, not execution, but executing. But, <laughs> but, but, but the idea here is that you hear this buzzword a lot. Uh, it's really design thinking is a term is the term, but really it comes with a kind of a creative incubation type of group mentality process that IDEO basically championed, and now we're having a lot of people around the world, OK? So if you don't know too much about IDEO, I encourage you to go and take a look at them. There's a great video on YouTube. But the idea is that they have, unlike other companies, their design firm with extremely, extremely diverse people. They have some law professors. They have some people from the medical profession. They have scientists. They, have, they create these teams of what they would call, <coughs> or what Hassel Plattner at, at SACP call, they call T-shaped people. People have a large base of knowledge, so they can talk to a lot of different people. But they have a couple, you know, at least one or a couple different uh, areas that they're extreme experts at. So we call T-shaped people. In our group, we call them, we have some people who are M-shaped people. They have a couple things that they're really, really good at. But the idea is that. These people are great because they're able to communicate to other different groups, and you're able to get that diverse, you know, like we talked about stock portfolios, diversity, or whatever. That's what you want. You don't want a problem that only solves one or two people's problem. You want to, want to solve that everybody. And unfortunately, smart as you, many books as you kind of got to read, you can only have so much limit on the knowledge you have. This design thinking thing really leverages that diversity, and hopefully you're going to kind of see that. And so that's why I think it'd be great when we kind of do this and we kind of road test this with all of us here. And hopefully we have a group of different people that have, it's going to be great that you guys aren't the same. Because the process doesn't work as well when you have eight of the exact same people. Some people have six or seven stages. This, the D school has, I've used their method of uh, five bubbles or five processes. But the idea is they're not all in a row. That'd be waterfall. This is sort of here, and there's intermaking links, and some are bigger than others. They're all different processes, but you can kind of jump around. But the idea is here, Xampasize, define, ideate, prototype, and test is, is, is literally what one way to get through the bubbles are. 
we're just going to talk about this empathizing. So hopefully we don't get you too hung up on looking at little bit pieces of it. That's not all design thinking. We're just in this one, and how we relate that back to the map part is that how do we create, sustain innovation, and keep people coming and getting back to your apps? Well, hopefully this empathy will get you in the right direction. So empathy has three keys. The first being observe, engage, and immerse. Why empathy? OK. The reason we have or we start with empathy because it basically guides or directs or focuses our innovation. You can be very, sometimes you can be running at 100 miles per hour, but you're running in the wrong way. It really doesn't help. Empathy helps to guide you in the right direction. And really, that's the first step. Narrow and refine target users. See, empathy helps with that. So it's really good about creating a focus for the target user, not just what you're going to focus your effort with, but focus what you, what you target. And, and this is a term that you'll hear a lot with design thinkers. We call it the golden thread. That means that we used to design things in the uh, rational rub process or waterfall or MSF, and we say, these are all the requirements that would make something a minimal viable product or, or you know, something that's shippable, and we must build all these products in order to create something. Uh, now, like earlier in the last presentation, I talked about something that I called good enough, and I talked about minimal viable product. The idea of golden thread is, is sort of turning that on its head. So the new industry now norm for some of this uh, more agile, iterative type of process is golden thread. So the idea is that you don't want to be the Swiss Army knife. If you ever tried to cut a steak with a Swiss Army knife, not a very good thing, right? I mean, somebody would say it's very good at being the multi-purpose tool when you're caught in the forest. I'm not talking about that. What I'm talking about is that if I had to choose between a bedernal steak knife and the Swiss Army knife, I, I know which one I, I'd kind of choose, right? The idea is that let's start with the golden thread. The one thing that makes your app or your product or your system or your platform better than anybody else's or meets some need. And then what we can do is we can add on things afterwards. Because what we don't want to do is don't want to delight, sorry, dilute that golden thread. So we want to have that moment, of, we want to focus on that one person. And it's a different paradigm. Another paradigm would say, if we have a large enough bucket of features, we will hit, you know, if we overlap the diagram, we will overlap large enough prop part of the population, and then we'll have enough people happy that will buy our software that we can make money at. We're trying to change that on our head. It's not about volume. It's about qual qua it's quality over quantity, golden thread. So that's what we're talking about here, about here with the empathy part. That's why we need that target users, OK? That one target user. We'll be talking about that a little bit later on. Lastly, it's mine for emotions and motivation. So, there's a little bit of part that, yeah, sure, we've had other agile processes that do some of these other things. But really, we haven't had, at least on the technical development side, we haven't had the tools that really are bringing things like from psychology and, and sociology and ethnography and bringing them back into tools that are into high tech industries like, like code development, right? So what we're doing is we're, it's new to development, but it might not have been new to other people. So really, we're talking about empathy. It, it, it really is important. Like, I mean, we're, we're, we're definitely learning about a lot of different things through empathy. So even before I get to, 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 to this point, I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the projects that are kind of going on. So I'll give you kind of a good story. You can definitely read about this on some of the other literature. But uh, one of the master's programs they did, I believe, at Stanford, from the D school, they wanted to look at a third world incubator. There is a lot of problems uh, in Place, more rural places of India and other places that uh, keeping kids warm enough to survive is actually a problem. And, and not so much here in North America, you know, especially in Canada where we have paid, uh, paid health care. We have a lot of technology here. But how, you know, how, how did we attack that in the world? They wanted to find a problem that was important. Mortality. Mortality was a big one for them. So how do we conquer this? So they wanted to figure out how we can build an incubator for it's sort of a generalized term, but a third world country or something like that. And so, you know, incubators cost thousands of dollars, and, and they're quite, if you, any of you guys, kids, have, but they're, they're really expensive. They're, they're really, they take a lot of power, they're hard to maintain, they're, you know, they're really they folded by, you know, very well to do hospitals. So the, these, these school people kind of thought, well, how do we do this, you know? And you know what? And a typical solution, but we'd go to attack the problems, how, how do we make things cheaper? How do we, you know, maybe go, f Lower the grade of plexiglass, is there that type of thermal type of thing, um, <coughs> that kind of thing. And without giving the story away, and I hope you guys will look it up, but basically what they did is they came up with a sort of a sleeping bag that has an insert that can be heated up in it, boiling water or anything, and it's good for up to 40 hours. 
and, and it's 100% portable, doesn't use any electricity and all that other stuff. Because what they did is they went to the thing and they realized that creating a, an incub a cheaper incubator, the way that we think of an incubator for the third world country, that's not the problem. The problem was the fact that some of these people in the rural communities they don't have access to hospitals, they don't have access to electricity, let alone hospitals and cares and stuff like that. So they created a quite, a, quite a neat contraption where, which actually is, is saving lives. It's making an impact on the world. That's where we, where we all kind of want to be. We want to develop something that changes the world. And to kind of play into that, maybe marketing speak of that part, is like one of the ways they came up with that is probably design thinking. And I'd probably argue that if we used one of our older methodologies, we probably wouldn't have got there. There's all these connotations that we started with the problem set, you know, and I know that the way they would have attacked it, and they, we would have never have gotten there. 